glad to get you all after seven hours of death by PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> keep that going for about 30 more minutes or 35 more minutes. Um, so just a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. We'll spend about 15 minutes going through the various fur bear species found on Long Island, and uh, we'll go through them one by one for their identification and life history information that you may or may not know. Hopefully I can at least teach you something new about each other. Um, and we'll go through how we currently manage fur bears on Long Island, their seasons, ways that they can be taken legally, um, and then we'll move on to our, our new citizen science project that we have going on. We have a, a fur bear inventory um, using citizen science and observations from the public. And lastly, we'll talk about coyotes in Suffolk County, um, the first confirmed observations, and uh, also just ways to live with coyotes. It could be five years down the road, it could be 50 years, it could be never, um, but just some general information that's applicable to all canids and fur bears in general that could be a nuisance. So start out real simply, what is a fur bear? Um, it's basically anything that was valued for its fur, I think it was sold or traded. Um, and so we, we don't consider a deer or a bear really a fur bear. They're not managed. When we talk about fur bears, um, we're talking about coyotes, raccoons, um, beavers. So in New York State, we manage 14 species as fur bears. Um, everything you see there that's highlighted in yellow um, are species that occur on Long Island to some extent. I'm going to start next to coyote because there, there is some research that, that shows them in New York City on Long Island, and then also we've had these observations from out in uh, Southampton. But we'll talk about that later. To the two weasels we don't have are Fisher and Martin. Um, they, as far as historic records I've never find, never occurred here. Um, and the bobcat, something that we talked about in our, in our management plan, that there, there is some interest in, in doing uh, basically habitat and, and feasibility models to, to look at whether or not we could have bobcats here in the future. Um, but it's not anything that's in that. Um, so we'll start out with the canids, the red fox. Um, these are pretty somewhat easy to, to identify. They're going to have those what are called black socks on their front legs. Uh, it's probably one of the best ways to know that you're looking at a red fox. A uh, white tip on the tail. Um, they are that reddish color. Sometimes people can confuse them with gray fox. We get a lot of reports of gray fox that turn out to be red fox. Um, essentially, you can see the, the reddish color coloration in addition to their whole back being solid gray, but uh, not solid gray, but gray. Um, Coyotes and extirpated from Long Island and most of the northeast or the northeast um, are the wolves. So red fox, um, just give you an idea of size. They're, they're going to be larger than a cat, but not really that much bigger. I mean, we're talking seven and a half pounds to about seventeen pounds. Um, they look a lot bigger, just because they're a lot uh, fluffier, I guess. Uh, they're found throughout the state. They're the most widely distributed carnivore in the world. Um, they were introduced to the United States, or the United States and they, in two ways. They were came here naturally during uh, when the glaciers were around, then they were also introduced. They're also introduced to places like Australia, um, but they're, they're pretty much in most places throughout the world. Uh, they're carnivore. They eat small mammals, birds. They'll also scavenge off carrion. They're basically opportunistic. They have four to eight young in late spring. And they do have a couple different color phases. Um, I'll be honest, I've never seen one of these color phases. I'm sure they're out there, but uh, most of the time you're going to see them. It's going to be pretty obvious that it's a red fox. Gray fox, they're about the same weight, slightly smaller. Um, they're found throughout the state, including Long Island. Um, their range extends from Southern California, or Southern Canada, to South America. Considering an omnivorous carnivore, because they will eat some fruits and grains in addition to the small mammals. Um, and they have similar number of young, four to eight. And one really neat thing about gray fox is that they can climb trees. They have some morphological adaptations where they, they have curved claws, and uh, also the way that their, their legs move, they can actually kind of grip the tree. So, I mean, that's a really neat picture um, of a fox climbing a tree. Actually, the only fox, gray fox, I've actually ever seen in person was dead 20 feet up a tree. No idea how it died, but 
It's just kind of neat and actually a long time ago when I learned to think of climb trees. <laughs> so coyotes, you see they're significantly larger than any fox. Um, and that's, that's one thing that's really important whenever we're talking about identifying coyote from a fox. We get a lot of phone calls about coyote observations that turn out to be a fox when we get a picture of it. Um, so frame of reference is always good when you're looking at these different animals. Uh, they're found throughout most of the United States, range from Alaska to Central America. They prey on a variety of species. They will prey on deer. Usually they're preying on fawns when they're preying on, on deer. Um, and when they are preying on adults, they're usually either hunter wounded, hunter killed and unrecovered, or um, hit by vehicles, things of that nature, so either wounded or already dead. Um, but it is possible for them to take an adult deer. It's just fairly rare. They will eat some fruits. The reproduction, they generally mate for life. Um, they breed in January to March. They have one litter annually and four to six um, young. They also have a couple different color phases. Um, just general things to look for. If you were to see a coyote, they have these pointed erect ears. And their tail, you can see, um, so that does not show really well. And sometimes it's not obvious, sometimes it is, but they will usually have a black spot on the end of their tail. And actually the way that they hold their tail is different than a lot of dogs um, or canids, where it's kind of at that <coughs> pointing down or less than a 45 degree angle. Um, here's just a picture to show you some of the color phases. Obviously looking for a black dot is not gonna do you much good on the black face, um, but you can see it's pretty obvious in the other ones here. These are pictures, I think, from the Westchester coyote study. A little bit about how coyotes colonize the northeast. Um, you can see in, in this map over here um, where they were pre-European settlement. Then we came in and removed all the wolves and it created more opportunity for them to expand their range. And they moved throughout the northeast. Basically in the, the 1900s they started moving further east. And uh, for New York State basically came in from there's a laser pointer or something. Oh, there's one. Kind of came in from the north and colonized down this way. And uh, we are on the forefront of that now. <coughs> Again, just differentiating between them. This is a nice slide to put it all together. Um, and what to look for. Throw a German Shepherd on there just for <coughs> comparison. Because um, believe it or not, we do, we do get um, reports that end up to be dogs. Um, but. The foxes, they, they really are small animals, and, and if you see a couple of them, you, you'll really get a good feel for how different they are than a coyote in terms of size. So next time, the, the next ones we'll talk about are the mustelids. Um, so we got mink, river otter, long-tailed and short-tailed weasels. These are extremely difficult to tell apart, um, unless you know a lot about weasels. The one thing it's easy to tell them from a mink, the side of the head pets they're using, is that mink's going to have a solid brown color to it, whereas the weasels are both going to have a white belly. And during the winter times in areas with colder climates, during the, the winter time they're also going to have a white paler. So mink, they're distributed throughout New York State again. Um, they weigh about one to three pounds. The males are slightly larger than the females. Total length is about somewhere between 12 and 18 inches. Um, they're gonna prey on small mammals, fish, crustaceans, amphibians, and birds. Uh, mink are kind of known for being a little bloodthirsty when they get into chicken coops and things of that nature, where they'll kill every single chicken in the coop, even though they're not gonna eat them all. Um, so they, they do get a bad rep, and, and those people who have chickens are usually not too big of a fan of mink. Um, reproduction, it does not form pair bonds. Um, they actually have a pretty brutal copulation period, and uh, breeding begins in April. They have delayed implantation. This is something that's a common theme with mustelids. Um, and what that is, is the they copulate, and then the fertilized egg <laughs> forms into a blastocyst, and that's basically waits uh, for these. It's, I believe it's eight months. Um, and then it implants in the uterus, and uh, then it begins to actually develop. So it's basically sitting there, not doing anything for a long period of time. And the evolutionary advantage of that 
is they can have their young during a, a more favorable environmental conditions. Because if they just had their young without having a period of time where they're kind of where they're just sitting there, they'd have them in the middle of the winter and they would have not have survival of their young. So they have about one to eight and an average of four kids. Where are our meats on the island? They miracle mile. That's why we don't. That's part of the citizen science. We're trying to get best. We're trying to get they're, they're distributed throughout Long Island, basically in places where we have habitat for them. We have meat. Um, River Otter were historically found in all watersheds in New York State. Um, there's a large scale reintroduction effort in the 1990s. Um, that basically they took River Otter from the Adirondacks and a few from the Catskills and put them into a bunch of different water bodies in western and central New York. It's a really big project, a lot of publicity around it. It was a great program. Um, they weigh about 10 to 30 pounds. So all the other weasels that we're talking about are very small, whereas these are really large. Um, total length is 38 to 44 inches. Again, the males are generally larger than the females. They're an important bioindicator species, and what that means is that being at higher up in the food chain and being at one location, too, is important. Um, they pick up a lot of contaminants. They're a good indicator of the health of the, system, the water body that they're in. Um, we use birds a lot for that, but the problem with using birds for that kind of information is that they're highly mobile, so I mean, a lot of them are migrating, so just because you've got that bird there and you get the information from it, it doesn't mean that it picked up those contaminants there. They're an aquatic generalist in their diet. Um, the reproduction, they breed December to May, again delayed implantation, um, 10 to 12 months after copulation, so they have even longer delayed implantation, and the litters are one to three, but up to five. And the juveniles disperse after about a year. So weasels, I put them together because they are so similar. Most of the information we'll go over here will be the same. They're historically found throughout Long Island. They weigh three to somewhere between 12, or three to 12 ounces. Their total length is somewhere between seven and 22 inches. Um, one thing when they are in that brown village, you can't tell the difference based on their feet. The uh, short-tailed weasels are ermine or ermine. Um, have white feet, but during the winter time, it's not going to help you much. Um, and one thing I don't have on there is they have a black dot at the end of their tail. That's what differentiates them from least weasel, which is another New York species of weasel. Um, reproduction is somewhere between June and August. Late implantation, but eight months. And uh, litters are four to five, but sometimes up to ten. And they diet again. They're they're carnivores. They're eating small mammals, birds, eggs, snakes, insects. Lastly, um, muskrat and beaver. Muskrats are found throughout New York State. Uh, they're about two to four pounds. There's a lot of concern with muskrat populations in the whole Northeast. They've been in a pretty consistent downturn, and, and right now we don't really have a great answer for why that is. Um, their total length is about 23 to 26 inches. Tail is laterally compressed. Um, they're generally an herbivore. They eat root stems, aquatic vegetation, but during certain times of the year, they will consume invertebrates, mollusks, and fish. Uh, reproduction, the breeding starts in April, and they have four to eight kits, up to three litters per year. And in the southern extent of their range, they'll actually, the young they have in their first litter can actually reproduce that first year. In northern latitudes, it's not likely to happen just because of the, the shortness of the breeding season. Beaver, they're the official mammal of New York State. You may not have known that. Uh, they're found in all areas of New York State except Long Island. I say except Long Island, even though we do have, at this point, we think it's only one. Um, it gets observed from time to time on East Hampton. There is evidence of it. There have been beaver lodges. Um, but the latest information I have is we do not think there's more than one. Uh, weighs about 26 to 65 pounds. Total length is about 35 inches, broad, flattened tail, um, really obvious when it's out of, out of the water. And you might hear this from time to time if you're ever upstate where there's a lot of beavers where they just smack the tail of the water when danger's around. Um, reproduction, lifelong pair bonds, breed in January to February, and the litters are two to seven kits. So, all right. So we're going to talk about how we manage with the DEC, how we manage Fur bearers on Long Island. And 
start that, we'll just talk about what the benefits are of having hunting and trapping seasons. Um, it's population management. We've removed all of the, the large predators from most of the Northeast. Um, distribution and abundance data. Trappers are actually, trappers and hunters are actually how we get most of our population information about these different species. Species, Because we get catch per unit effort, we can track trends, which is going to be reflective of the population if you have enough data going into that. Um, by tracking some of these species, it can help with habitat and property damage protection. All you need to do is look at, at deer in the east end and what they've done to the forest to see how unregulated wildlife can have negative um, implications for property or habitat in general. Um, or beaver lodges, you look at, because um, they're going to eventually wash out. They have other impacts on fisheries and, and a lot of different things. So funding for wildlife and habitat protection because of the money being put into the system. A, a lot of it is coming from hunters and trappers. So currently our trapping season in Long Island is from November, from November 1st to February 25th, except we have no season for coyotes. Obviously, because until recently we didn't have any, but something that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, it's also closed for beaver and otter. Um, same thing with them. Mink and muskrat, December 15th to February 25th. And then for, we lump a lot of species together. A lot of the methods for trapping a lot of these species are the same. Um, so. That's, a, that's part of the reason why they're all lumped together. And uh, for hunting season, it's the same October 25th through February 15th, and uh, closed again for coyotes. So now we know what seasons are available, what people can go out and harvest these animals. Now we'll look at how many are there out there. So in 2012-2013, we only have 187 licensed trappers who live on Long Island. That doesn't mean that we have 187 people who trap on Long Island. That just means that's where they live and that's where they bought their license. Um, the number is actually a lot lower that, than that that actively trap. So using a trapper survey and small game surveys, we can get an idea of how many people are actively hunting or trapping um, these various species. And so what I did here is I took seven years worth of data and just averaged it together. Um, and so you can see on average there's only 12 people attempting to trap gray fox. And they're taking about two, somewhere between two and three, those 12 people. Um, and I know this is going to come up later, so I'll, I'll just talk about it now. Um, gray fox, when people are attempting to trap gray fox, they are catching gray fox. So that's part of the reason why we can't justify closing a season on gray fox, because there's no evidence to suggest it can't sustain the harvest, because year in and year out, with very few people attempting to trap them, they are still trapping them. Um, so main you can see about 14 people, and again, they're trapping very few. Um, even red fox, which you know are incredibly abundant on Long Island, they still don't trap very many for 27 people attempting to trap them. So just to give you an idea also, reiterating that these are, all these species are regulated wildlife, so you can't just go and remove these animals at any time for no reason whatsoever. Almost all the fur-bearing species, you actually need a permit if it's just a nuisance. So if it's in someone's backyard repeatedly and it keeps coming back, it can't just be removed. There's, there's steps that can be taken before we go to the point of needing a permit to remove that animal because a lot of it is caused by the people themselves by just not doing, taking some simple precautions to eliminate the pests before it gets to a situation that needs lethal removal of that animal. Um, the only exception is, is a skunk. Um, but however, if they are damaging property, um, they can be removed, most of them, except for beaver, mink, and river otter. So for those definitions, we need a definition of what is a nuisance and what's damaging. So nuisance wildlife is basically an animal that could cause damage. Um, but ne not necessarily is causing damage right now, but they're perceived as a threat to, to human health or safety. So it's more of an annoyance, an animal that's constantly hanging around but not actually causing damage or hurting anyone. Damaging wildlife is anything that's actually damaging um, your property or chasing your pets or something of that nature. All right, so that was a real quick and dirty approach to how we manage fur bears. And now we'll go on to our 
current efforts to collect more information on these species. Because as, as you saw, we don't have a lot of trappers, so it makes it difficult to get reliable data on those various species and their distribution um, when you only have 12 or 14 people out there pursuing them recreationally. So the species that we're really concerned with and that we're just trying to gather more information are, um, are uh, gray fox, mink, coyote, skunk, weasels. Um, we lump them together for this because they are so difficult to identify. Um, river otter and beaver. The objective of this citizen science project is basically to identify hotspots and uh, document spatial distribution. So identifying hotspots, if we get 25 reports of a coyote with no picture, no confirmation, no way to confirm what was actually seen, it helps us because then we can go out and do different surveys or put out camera traps or do something to help get a confirmed hit in that area and get more information about where they are. And also more to guide future data collection efforts that we, that we may uh, pursue. The, in addition to the harvest information that I share with you, the only other information we really have is from the bow hunter sighting logs. So this is basically hunters volunteer when they're sitting in their tree stand, they keep a log. I was out hunting for seven and a half hours. I saw four coyote, one bobcat, and 10 deer. That type of thing, and then it gets put into catch per unit effort basically, so sightings per thousand hours. As you can see, by and large for coyote, gray fox, and um, skunks, you can see very few. Um, gray fox is, tends to be a little bit higher than any of those three. Then you have red fox, which are obviously way up there, and uh, also raccoons are very high. So we're trying to bulk up that kind of information that we have. Um, so how you can participate, because it is really important. This is totally based on, it's only as good as the information that we're getting from the public. So take a picture, that's, that's really important. If you can get a picture to help us confirm it, it's really important. Either of the animal, the track, the scat, um, and scale is really important. When you're taking a picture of a, of a track, if you just give us a picture of a track, but there's no scale next to it, it makes it really difficult to identify, especially if you're trying to figure out, is it a fox, is it a coyote, is it a dog? Dogs, you can uh, domestic dogs, you can tell the difference. But uh, um, so that's really important. Scale. Where did you see it? What type of habitat was it in? Was it in a wetland? Was it swimming through the middle of a wetland, or was it running across the field? Um, how many did you see? And just a physical description, the best you can come up with. Um, we don't expect you to be perfect. It's not a horrible thing if we get a misidentified animal. It's more important that we get if you are pretty confident that what you saw was one of these species, it's important for us to get that information. Because like I said, if we keep getting observations in the same area, that data can be useful. I mean, if you have no idea and you saw a blur, blur go across the road, that's different. But I mean, if you're pretty confident in what you saw. So then what you do is you go to our website. Don't worry about writing this down. I have it at the end of the, the PowerPoint presentation. But we have a survey gizmo page that takes you to an external link. And you put in all the information. You can attach pictures. Um, and leave your contact information because we may want to call you up and just try to just talk to you about it and get more information that maybe you didn't even think about when you're looking at it. But when questioned, um, you may be able to give us more information and help us get more accurate data. Real quick, just to give you an idea of what, what results we've had today, we've had very few observations reported to us. This has been up for about nine months or so, and we've had, I think it's about 30 reports total. Um, and you can see we really have had those clusters yet, except for the, the ones in Montauk for coyotes, which could be ones that were close to um, Bridgehampton area or Watermill, something of that nature. But uh, we do have a lot, a bunch of gray fox observations. The question is, are they gray? Is, are they? Gray? We didn't get any pictures of these animals, and that, that's really why I stress pictures are, are great information. With the availability of cell phones and being able to take good pictures, um, it really it would be great if we could get some pictures. But any, any information is good information. Um, and in Nassau County, we've had very few, we've had four, and zero in New York City. This is something we ran into a lot this, this summer after the first observation of that coyote. We were getting five or six phone calls a day, um, and what what happened was we had a pretty boom year for mange and red fox this year, and I can completely see how someone was very confused on what they were looking at there. Um, it's, lioness. It's a, what? Looks like a lioness. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. So uh, we got a lot of these phone calls and a lot of pictures of mangy fox this year. Um, so that, that's just another confounding variable, variable that makes it kind of difficult to just look at those and, and take them for what they are. Um, and lastly, real quick, we're just going to go through the one observation. Uh, I guess you should, should say coyotes out Long Island, but yeah. <laughs> it, uh, oh, that a coyote? And it's not Long Island. <laughs> it is on Long Island. Right. Right. Yeah, I've, been, I've been to exactly where that picture was taken. Um, but there, uh, there was an observation this summer that I'm sure a lot of people have seen on the news. Um, seen in Southampton. Um, and basically, in response to that observation, we set out four game cameras within about a mile and a half. We got permission from the farmer who was nice enough to let us go out there and put up some camera traps. Um, Baited the locations with artificial bird's nests. Basically, we took chicken eggs, covered them up as a bird would do when they leave their nest, and uh, left them for a little bit over a week. And then we were able to get what we actually wanted to use, which was a gland lure. So then we left it out there for a month. First time around when we checked the cameras, we didn't have any pictures um, other than pictures of raccoons and deer eating the eggs, which was kind of interesting. Uh, but uh, the second time around, this just give you an idea of where we put them all. Um, where we ended up getting a hit was actually on this camera, the furthest one away from where it was observed, about a mile and a half from there. Um, and these are the pictures we got. He hung around for about 15 minutes at the camera. I got multiple pictures of it. Um, so, again, using observations from the public to get, gather more information. Um, fortunately, we had some issues with two of the cameras. So only two of them were working. We got his pictures, so we have no idea if he went to some of the other cameras as well. That's a key. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea if it's the only one. Um, we're pretty confident right now that it is the only one, but we really don't know. There's a possibility that there are more out there. Um, don't really know how it got there. There's a lot of different possibilities. It could have been released. Um, there's some articles that suggest that we'll follow railroad tracks as travel corridors. Coyotes do disperse a long distance. Juveniles um, upstate travel as far as 400 miles from where their had transmitters put on them. So they, they can move a long distance in short order. Something like a railroad track would provide a great corridor, which runs directly to that area. So, But it's all speculation and anyone's best guess as to how it got there. And lastly, just people and coyotes, they can, they can coexist. Canines, or in general, you can coexist with. It's just a matter of taking care of attractants. Um, unfortunately, especially with coyotes, backyards make great habitat. We see it in Westchester County. We see it in other places where these interactions happen. And it really is about people, I mean, just taking care of the things you can control in your backyard that are going to attract these animals, whether it's a skunk or whether it's a raccoon. Um, just things you want, simple steps that you want to take. Um, just real quick, these are coyote incident reports from 2006. This is from uh, one of the uh, graduate students that was working on his PhD. Um, and he worked a lot in Westchester County. You can see places where we have a lot of people, we have a lot of incidents with coyotes where people are complaining about the presence. But you also notice there are a lot of um, situations where it's not, category four is basically the least severe, someone observing a coyote basically. Um, you'll notice there's a really high proportion of those. So putting it into perspective, because I know there, there, there are some people who are terrified of coyotes and fox and things of that nature. In the, we've had a handful of attacks on coyotes in the Northeast in the past 20 years. Um, whereas if you just look at domestic dogs, the number of injuries, the people who seek uh, medical attention for injuries is exponentially higher. Um, so in New York alone, 600 pe 650 people are hospitalized each year by domestic dog bites. So what can you do to prevent any type, whether it's a fox in your backyard or a raccoon? Remove potential food sources, even cats outdoors. You're, attracting problems to your backyards um, outside of the cats just because other things are going to eat that food that you're putting out there. Um, and unfortunately, it's the same situation as you see with bears upstate. Fortunately, a, a fed bear is a dead bear, they say. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's the case a lot of times with um, any of these other animals where people keep inviting them into their backyards, then they start causing a problem for all their neighbors 
And unfortunately, the animal is the one that usually loses out in that situation. Um, feeding, feed pets indoors, remove bird seed, um, garbage. Just keep your garbage in a place where it's secure, where a raccoon isn't going to get into it. I'm sure you don't want to pick it up after they get into it any more than uh, you want that other problems that come along with it. Um, with coyotes, again, we're not there. We're not to the point where we have to worry about this at this point, but you don't want to let small dogs and things because they can take a small dog. Um, you see a coyote, you don't want to act timidly. Um, not very likely right now, but uh, and remove the piles of debris, thick vegetation, places where a fox can get under or another animal could get under and, and use as a denning location. And share the information. If you see a red fox around all the time and it's just kind of walking through, just share that information with your neighbors um, just so they're aware. And just in summary, this this fur bearer survey will only work if we can get information from the public and we get observations. The more information we can get from the public, the better, and the more informed our future decisions will be. Um, and like I said, right now we're not at the point of dealing with coyotes in Long Island. It may never happen. It may happen in the near future. Um, how long that takes, we really don't know. Um, as I said, there are some coyotes that have taken up residence in Queens. The question is, are there enough to propagate that population, things of that nature? Are there going to be enough? We have that wonderful barrier of New York City that prevents things from getting here um, <laughs> and naturally recolonizing the area. But as you can see, they have done it. So, all right. Any questions? Okay, so a number of us are very disappointed in the uh, fact that the gray fox uh, is still out of traffic. And I noticed that you did map out where you're getting, uh, where people are actually catching two gray foxes here. Mm -hmm. looking at catch per unit effort. People are going out there and putting out very little effort, but they're still catching stuff. That implies that there's more than maybe, I mean, basically what you're saying is anecdotally they're not there. We don't know that they're not there. When What information we do have is that they are there, and they are being, every time someone goes out and, and tries to trap them, they are catching them. So that's, it's the best information we have to make a management decision. It's a matter of those areas probably the last level. That is typically where we get a, a lot of the reports that, that I have gotten outside of this surveyor home survey that come from that area. Can we access that information as the public? Like, I know I've seen the bow hunters' surveys and what they've seen. Is there a way I can go on to your site and see where all this stuff looks like, where the mink are being caught? Uh, that information, like we, we, don't, we don't have. Um, Mink and gray fox are not tagged individually. Like, um, for some species of fur bear, you have to get a pelt seal for every single one that's caught. They're not one of those species. So we don't have exact location information for every one that's trapped. So that harvest information I gave you was based on a trapper survey where people fill out and say, I set out X number of traps for X number of nights, and this is what I caught. Um, so, yeah, but that information is available on our website. It is available. Yeah. Why would you want to reintroduce 
can say we want to reintroduce Bobcats. And I said that there are a group of people who would like to reintroduce Bobcats. And in our Bobcat management plan, um, we say that we would be willing to look at habitat feasibility um, for Bobcats in the area. But as I said, it's nothing imminent or anything we plan on doing in the near future. <laughs> Yeah, eventually. Right now, we don't have enough data to really say anything. Yeah, it's not going to be exact. Well, no, that it's not going to be exact information. They saw it at the corner of this intersection. It's, it's going to be nothing like that. This is more information to guide us. Yes. Uh, is there a protection in place for the coyotes and the gray fox? I'm just saying there is such a small population that's there. And is there any law that you can see that the animals can go and get a human nuisance license? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I said, they, they can be. If, it, if the animal is causing, a, uh, is destroying property, or is threatening people, or threatening livestock, or threatening pets, the animal can be destroyed, um, but coyotes are 100% protected in or on Long Island. Yes. Um, do you have any advice about for people in the field, like across the carcass or the stack? I mean, I came across a box of carcass, which mm -hmm. you don't come across often unless it's broken. And I live out on East End, and I found this in British Hampton, and I thought maybe it was our coyote who had gotten that red fox, because it's the first red fox on the side I've ever found. I do, but it's not in this presentation. <laughs> and I am drawing a blank right now as to how they will typically feed on a carcass. There is a difference. There is a difference between like a, a domestic dog or something like that. If it were to kill something, um, it, it does. They do have a tendency to eat a car or, uh, an animal in a different way. Yes. Has there been any consideration about reintroducing beavers in Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. The Common River Dam. There are two in the Bronx River. Please report. It's going to flood out the Bronx River. Yeah. Um, I have a pretty good nose for a, a scent of a fox. A fox can't tell if it's gray or red on that. I don't know if that's useful information in citizen science or not because I can pinpoint, you know, within a foot where they can mark something. Yeah, it's usually better, like, because we're not concerned with red foxes, they're everywhere, um, it, it's, we really need an observation of the animal, or, um, yeah. On the other hand, when, um, when I'm driving through on the North Fork, I often pick up the scent of skunk, uh, between, uh, Baden Hollow and Manitoba. I used to only know them from around Calvary. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, I don't know if they're going west or east or if I'm just going east, but um, is that, again, it's not a sighting, it's a scenting. That, that's something that, if you are convinced it's the, the smell of a skunk, yeah. then yeah, absolutely, you could report it. That's yes. worth reporting. 60 miles an hour on the just, there's, there's a whole field for comments, yes. general comments. We can right. write it in there and we can do with it as we need. Is there interest in roadkill data for non-perverse species like I didn't believe they were, um, but I could be wrong. That's, that's outside of my purview, I guess, as what I do on a daily basis. I'm not completely 100% up on it. Yeah. Getting back to the following on Mike's question, you yep. relied on the catch per unit effort. Yep. Which is useful, but it's not absolute as a measure, as you know, an index yep. for population trends. Now, have you done CPU on all the species here that gives the department the confidence to believe that these species are able to sustain the trapping level that's going on? The problem is the, the, the confidence intervals on that, because obviously you're looking at 12 people who are out there trapping them, and 
of those people, how many of those were actually the people we surveyed? Because it's a, it's a subset of that that we actually surveyed for the Trapper survey. Um, so it, it's very difficult to say exactly. It's not 100%. It's the best information we have to go on and it supports our management decision. I understand. Could, could you just as easily take that information and reach just the opposite conclusion to say that we don't, based on a small set, but the, the information that we have, we don't have enough information to warrant One is, one is based on the data we have, one is based on anecdotal information. So that, that's basically where it stands right now. No, 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 no. I'm saying using the information, not, not anecdotal. Yes. No, the information you have. Can you reasonably draw the conclusion that these species, actually, I wouldn't even just say great fox, I would say skunk, and even mink, and the weasels. I mean, I've seen, I've seen like three weasels in my life up all around. I don't, again, that's anecdotal. I know, maybe people aren't trapping them, but given all the pressures that Long Island wildlife had, uh, does it really make sense to continue the trapping season here? Is that just an added element of mortality for these species? You say yes, and I think the argument could be made just as strongly that no. I spent four years in the, in the uh, capsule area. There's tons of gray fox out there. Sure. One. Yeah. One that was dead. I, I, I mean, it's not, they're, they're secretive species. You're not going to see them all the time. So, again, I, I understand your point, but at this point, we, we disagree. Yeah. From, from your experience and, and knowledge, not just here on Long Island, but in other places, um, uh, this is in regard to the coyotes and, and with uh, feral uh, cats. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that uh, when coyotes are in an area that the feral cats are kind of kept in check? Or do those two not really uh, have any sort of uh, connection? Depends on which literature you look at. There are some places in literature that suggest that they can actually become cat specialists, basically. Um, oh. And then other literature from Westchester County, um, Dr. Bogan um, did his research with Paul Curtis at Cornell, and, and they found that they found very little evidence of cat remains in um, their samples that they took from coyotes in that area. So, and there are a lot of feral cats in Westchester, so um, it's really dependent probably on the food sources that are available um, and how ample the prey is, other prey, and how easy it is. I mean, like, cat is a pretty formidable foe for any time. I mean, yeah, it's a 40 pound dog, but cats have claws and too. So. Yes. You know, I, I got from Fisher's Island, is, you know, a and that we have coyotes now, mm -hmm. and they almost completely eliminated the feral cats. Yeah. You can't even find the house cats. So, they're, they are pretty formidable. Yes. Can a red fox get up a tree? It's at an angle, and it's not too steep, it's possible, but they don't have those adaptations that a gray fox has. They can jump very high, I mean, six, six to seven feet, it's possible that they could jump. Um, so, they are. If I saw a fox flying up about eight feet into a tree. Yeah, especially if it's a vertical tree, if it's not leaning at like a 45 degree angle, it's pretty safe. <laughs> what was that fox?